Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, September 20th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Forensics investigations often involve the collections of file access and modification time and the probably go-to tool for this in the open source world is Mac Robber. Now Mac here doesn't stand for Macintosh, instead it's short for modification, access and creation, which are the three basic timestamps that you usually find associated with files. Now Jim ran into a case where this tool didn't work for him, so he rewrote it in Python with a couple of changes. That's sort of a typical open source thing, of course, that tools like this get redeveloped. And well, a Mac robber itself actually started out as Grave Robber and was then later, for similar reasons, rewritten as Mac Robber. And now you have a Python version that will work on various operating systems more seamless than the old version. A link to the GitHub repository for this tool can be found in Jim's diary. And Apache released an update for Tomcat that does fix two vulnerabilities. The first one is a remote code execution vulnerability that is enabled if you are enabling the HTTP put method. Now, HTTP put allows someone to upload files to a system. In this particular case, of course, if they're downloading JSP scripts, these scripts may be executed. The second vulnerability does take advantage of the virtual dear context in order to view source code. So no remote code execution here, but still something you probably do want to fix. Overall, these vulnerabilities do only affect these specific configurations. They're not quite as severe as these recent struts vulnerabilities, but certainly something that you do want to patch rather quickly. And Apple today, of course, released new major versions of iOS, tvOS, and watchOS. Now, with this, as usual, we do also get a number of security updates. Interestingly, Apple hasn't made any security details available yet for watchOS or tvOS. Typically, there was a lot of overlap here uh, with iOS due to some of the common code base. Now for iOS, only eight different vulnerabilities got fixed. Uh, the probably most interesting one here is one in Exchange Active Sync that could lead to an erase of the device during setting up an Exchange account. A pretty interesting vulnerability. Now in addition to these operating systems, Apple also updated Xcode. Now Xcode is typically not installed by default. The big fix here is is a fix to Git. This particular vulnerability was actually already made public quite a while ago. I mentioned it here and it does affect SSH URL schemes that could be used to execute arbitrary code. Now, if you're using Xcode, you definitely should apply this particular patch rather quickly. As far as the other updates go to the operating system, given that there weren't really any sort of huge major fixes in these updates, and given that these updates do actually change the functionality of your devices quite a bit, I would be careful with just rushing out an update for these particular operating systems. The update for Safari does of course affect the desktop systems, Mac OS Sierra and OS X El Capitan. Now there is also an update for OS X coming. I believe it's supposed to be released within a few weeks. And sticking with the Mac here for one more story, there is a very popular terminal alternative called iTerm that's often used for the Mac that exhibited an interesting vulnerability. If you hovered your mouse over text that resembled a URL and held down the command key on the keyboard, then the text you hovered over was actually sent out as a DNS query. This is actually not really all 
all that uncommon. A lot of software does try to interpret uh, URLs as you are hovering over them or for example, as your open documents and email and is sort of doing preemptive DNS lookups on these URLs or the hostname part of these URLs. This has become more and more of a problem as we have more and more of these top level domains and uh, with these generic top level domains, more and more strings look like a host name, probably most notable the .zip top level domain, which I believe is uh, being is owned by Google. It's not really used yet, but it could potentially trigger DNS lookups for zip file names that will be directed to Google if your system does actually attempt to recognize this as a top level domain. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.